The instructor for the series, Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Cooper, United States Marine Corps retired, has taught the arts of weapon craft to military and police organizations as well as civilians all over the world. Well known as an authority on all the small arms of the world, Jeff is also a university history and government instructor. He's the author of a half dozen books on sporting and combat firearms, from custom rifle building to handgun hunting, as well as his specialty of fighting handguns. As an arms consultant, Jeff constantly evaluates the latest arms designs of the manufacturers throughout the world. His viewpoint is that of practicality. To Jeff Cooper, a new device is not as important as an improvement in tactical use, and expert tactical use of the service handgun is what this series is all about. You have been chosen to receive and carry a sidearm. You can be proud, because to be issued a service pistol is to be given an unparalleled symbol of public trust. This program is to familiarize you with our most common service handguns. You may be issued a revolver, such as is widely used by civil police forces, or an automatic pistol, like this standard military sidearm. Over the last century and a half, arms like these have saved the lives of many good men, police officers and soldiers alike. Because of this, the service pistol has played an honorable role in the keeping of world peace and civil order throughout the free world. In civilian life, it is the first line of society's defense against crime and violence. It may go unused for all the years of a police officer's duty, but when an emergency arises, your service pistol is your best friend. Men had sought after powerful repeating firearms for centuries, before Sam Colt's early revolvers arrived on the expanding American frontier in the late 1830s. For the first time, one man could be a match for several assailants at close range. Cavalry troopers came into wide use in the 19th century, armed with two or more powerful six-shot pistols. Their ability to carry the fight to the enemy was unequaled in history. Cavalry troopers learned to hunt the buffalo and the Plains Indian Brave from horseback with service pistols like this 1873. Like most repeating pistols of its day, this Colt 45 was a single action revolver. Its design had progressed from loose powder and ball to fixed cartridge ammunition, accurate and powerful enough to stop a charging horse or a man many yards away. But its thumb cocking action and slow reloading kept designers searching for greater firepower. By the turn of the 20th century, the double action revolver had replaced the single action as a government service pistol. Now, one pull of the trigger would fire around in a fraction of a second if there was no time to cock the hammer. Reloading speed of the new design was doubled as well. In 1911, the US government adopted the GI sidearm still issued, the 45 caliber Colt automatic pistol. Eight powerful shots could be fired with light touches on the trigger, and seven more loaded in a fraction of the time needed to load six revolver rounds. An eighth round could be carried in the automatic's chamber. The most powerful military automatic in the world, the GI-45 has given the longest unbroken record of service of any United States military issue small arm, whether rifle, pistol, or shotgun. While the 45 automatic had become the arm of two world wars, the 38 caliber revolver had grown into our society's primary weapon against crime and disorder. The Smith & Wesson Model 10 revolver, often called the military and police model, was first sold in 1899. Like the Army 45, it has changed very little. Both guns are widely issued for personal defense of both police officers and military personnel. The middle handgun in this line is a pistol which is essentially a more powerful version of the 38 Special. Called the 357 Magnum, it is the choice of many highway police and Western American peace officers because of its extra power and longer effective combat range. Any pistol 
is a handheld machine for putting power exactly where you need it. In combat, that power may have to be translated into close range stopping power, penetration, or long range accuracy. Let's look at some demonstrations of each. The seven yard stopping power of the 38 Special is only moderate. Research shows that it offers just a 50% chance of stopping an assailant with one shot. Its wide use is based on its relatively light recoil and ease of training. The 357 Magnum bullet is the same size as the 38 Special, but travels much faster because of its larger powder charge. Seven yard power is noticeably greater than the 38's, and experts say that the 357 will stop a determined attacker 95 out of 100 times. Stopping power ratio of the GI 45 is known to be 49 out of 50 times. In addition, it will deliver as many as eight shots with one loading. The weight and size of its bullet take the place of extra speed. In combat, penetration allows you to strike your enemy when he has taken cover or is committing felony escape in a vehicle. We use a car door as a test of penetration. Standard 38 special loads are not known for great penetration. Non-standard ammunition must be used to ensure dependable penetration on barricades or vehicles. Such ammunition lacks stopping power, however. In contrast, standard loadings of the 357 are so penetrating that many civil police organizations prefer to stay with the less powerful 38 Special to cut down danger to citizens near a shooting incident. The GI-45 service load, called hardball, is a good but not excessive penetrator. High power is available to equal 357 penetration. All three, 38, 357, and 45 service handguns are accurate enough to challenge a marksman's ability to get the most out of them. These 50-yard targets will show you why it's worthwhile to learn marksmanship well. The fixed, non-adjustable sights of the 38 Model 10 are almost unbreakable, but slightly less versatile than the adjustable target type sights found on some other 38s and 357s. However, fixed sights are quite adequate for combat service. The 357 shows the advantage of fine sights. While the 45 Auto shows the inherent accuracy of feeding cartridges directly into the firing chamber instead of a revolving cylinder. After firing, the handgun is cleared twice, just to be sure of its safety. Then it's a good practice to holster your sidearm securely. Await the instruction of your range master before you draw it again. In time, you will grow as accustomed to wearing your service pistol as this police officer is. He may never have to unstrap the handgun in the line of duty, but it serves its purpose to society as a badge of authority and a ready arm of law and order, just as an officer's off-duty sidearm does. Once entrusted with a service pistol, neither soldier nor police officer is ever really off duty. Whatever your role, we have tried to give you an idea of the background and characteristics of common service pistols. You will soon begin marksmanship training to qualify as a skilled user of your duty handgun. Before going to the range to commence instruction, you should know the basic controls and safety devices of revolvers and automatics. This shooter holds his gun in the raised pistol position muzzle pointed safely downrange while he clears his revolver. We see the cylinder latch, ejector rod, trigger, hammer. Standard double action revolvers are not equipped with safety catches of any kind as it takes a conscious effort to either pull the trigger fully or cock the hammer. 
The only safe way to carry a revolver is hammer down. Never carry it cocked. The 45 government model is cleared by removing its magazine and opening the action to empty the chamber. This thumb safety latch is designed to lock the cocked hammer securely until pressed downward with a conscious effort. Unless the shooting hand depresses this grip safety bar, the hammer cannot be released. A built-in safety to guard against accidental discharges. Any automatic pistol is safest when the action is locked open. When a loaded magazine is inserted and the action closed, a round is automatically chambered. Unless the 45 is to be fired immediately, the thumb safety should be locked on and the pistol either benched or holstered securely. As soon as convenient after firing your service pistol, it should be cleaned, both to make sure that it does not corrode and to ensure its continued proper functioning. An automatic pistol of this design is simply stripped. First, you remove the magazine. Then, check to be sure that you have no shell in the chamber. Then, remove the recoil spring plunger by turning the barrel bushing. The slide is then retracted until the slide stop may be removed. Then the slide slid forward off the frame. In this position, the recoil spring and guide may be removed and the barrel extracted from the front. This may seem complicated, but it really is quite simple after a little reference to your study guide. On an American swing-out double-action revolver such as this, the first step is to swing the cylinder out. With the Smith & Wesson, the latch is pressed forward. With the Colt, the latch is pressed to the rear, but the action is the same. To take the pistol down further, you may remove the cylinder in this fashion. Swing it out, thus. Now, back off this screw on this side of the frame until it comes away. Now the cylinder can be moved straight forward off the frame. In this position the pistol is ready to be cleaned both in each chamber and in the barrel with a rod, a jag, a brush. The service sidearms shown here are the products of years of development and dependable service. They have a long and honorable heritage to which you may contribute. You will learn to use their power in the service of your country. To become a qualified marksman with your duty sidearm, you must understand how a handgun works. Since handgun designs and shooting techniques have progressed logically throughout history, we can learn a lot about today's sidearms by turning back to the beginnings of one-hand firearms. The earliest handguns were actually hand cannons. They required two hands to shoot, one to hold the simple tube, and the other to hold a heated wire or flame to a touch hole. They seldom had sights, and ranges had to be short. By the early 1800s, sights, rifling, and powders had improved. The first repeating handguns to be anything but experiments were Colt's cap and ball revolvers of the 1830s. The pistols soon developed into powerful arms that could deliver six effective shots in a few seconds. Thumb cocking actions like the powder and ball Colts gradually gave way to cartridge loading double action revolvers, still the most common police sidearm in America. By World War I, semi-automatic pistols had been adopted by most governments. The 45 automatic's firepower and easy reloading have made it the U.S. government's sidearm for over 60 years. Certain methods of shooting sidearms have been traditional for a long time. The pistols were often used as offensive weapons. 
Ritters, cavalry mercenaries in medieval Germany, rode into battle firing volleys at arm's length and wheeling their horses so the succeeding ranks could also fire in rapid succession. Many men still fire solely by the straight arm pointing method. As we continue with this program, we will examine both the advantages and disadvantages of point shooting without sights. The Code Duello brought with it the finely made dueling pistol. These handguns had good sights and were best fired by men who coolly took careful aim. Today's target matches almost duplicate the duello method of aiming through sights, with the handgun extended to arm's length. Our American West was the place where hip shooting, repeat shots delivered from somewhere between waist and chest, became a piece of American folklore. Many law enforcement agencies still teach a nearly identical form of close range impulse firing. Each of these well-known shooting techniques has served its purpose in its time, but all relate to needs that were far different from the great variety of sidearm duties in this, the late 20th century. Civil police officers are sworn to uphold the peace day and night. On the North American continent, an officer's duties may involve shooting at ranges from zero to 50 yards in a second's notice. The combat infantryman is often burdened by a radio or parts of a crew serve weapon while he defends himself against several armed assailants. Military provost marshal personnel are faced with a combination of police and military tactical problems. Your duty revolver is now as accurate as a fine dueling pistol, as powerful as many so-called horse pistols, and can deliver several shots in a few seconds. To solve the great variety of today's tactical problems, a shooting technique must make the best use of your handgun's features of accuracy, power, and speed. One of these qualities will solve any tactical situation. Accuracy reaches your assailant when he is far away or partly concealed. Power disables at a distance or breaks through cover to stop the adversary. Speed of fire and reloading stops fights quickly and efficiently. With speed, you can deal with more than one opponent. In this program, we will show you how to begin mastery of each of these factors of pistol combat. Of the traditional shooting techniques already discussed, three so-called combat methods have evolved. The first of these is hip or impulse shooting. The gun is held below eye level, often at or just above the hip and fired without aligning the sights. Men who fire hundreds of rounds per month with the same pistol will gradually learn to score a large percentage of first shot hits, even at 15 or 20 yards. However, the time and ammunition required to begin to perfect this method are prohibitive in group training. Military or law enforcement trainees need a basic method that gives useful skill in a short period of time. The earliest and now most famous American system of training for pistol combat was the practical pistol course pioneered by the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the late 1920s. The FBI Academy designed the PPC to school revolver shooters in fast, close-range hits at the seven yards range with modified hip shooting, deliberate eye level accuracy at 25 yards, and prone or kneeling shooting at 25, 50, and 60 yards. The PPC and variations on it are still taught. Competitions based on its rules are held for civil and military police officers in many countries. Many authorities have stated that the PPC, as originally devised, did not reflect an allowance for the tactical advantages of automatic pistols, that there were too many variables in the standing, crouching, kneeling, and prone positions, or that the PPC two handholds are not as strong as the weaver stance, developed in open competition during the 1960s. This reporter has long been an advocate of a simplified course based on an improved two handhold and quick sight picture. Using an erect stance and extending the sidearm at eye level, the shooter can respond quickly and accurately to the widest range of tactical challenges. With this system, often called the Cooper combat method, hip shots are seldom taken over five yards. Prone shots are reserved for targets beyond 50 yards. Open competition has shown that a shooter can draw his duty sidearm and deliver an aimed shot in well under one and one half seconds with only a few days of correct practice. Here, we will use the Cooper method to illustrate the disciplines of handgun qualification. In general, these principles, body placement, muscle control, concentration, and technique, apply to any given system of marksmanship, whether characterized by single or two-hand holds. 
A primary concern in any firearms training is marksmanship. Only practice brings consistent accuracy. But consciously applying the principles in this course will make you a dangerous adversary and a safe gun handler. Begin range practice with your gun holstered. Learn how to set your position so that when the gun is drawn, it comes to eye level with no strain on any part of the body. This shooter uses the Weaver combat firing position. His position is erect and natural. A good test of body alignment is to find your target and then draw with your eyes momentarily closed. The gun should line up quite close to a correct sight picture with little or no tension on the torso or head and neck muscles. Notice that in this position there is a two-hand hold with the gun hand firmly punched into the supporting hand. Only the arm muscles are tense. Once the body is supporting the gun in line with the target, the shooter must shift his concentration to the front sight of the pistol and get a quick sight picture, almost as a check on his natural positioning. Research proves that a man can learn to align sights in as little as one one hundredth of a second. Only the gravest emergency calls for a hip shot, and only at point-blank range. You can learn to deliver unsighted shots very accurately, but only at a cost of hundreds of hours and thousands of practice rounds. The last element in an accurate shot is the trigger pull itself. As the eyes align sights and target, the trigger is depressed smoothly, but quickly. The object is a surprise break, dropping the hammer as the sights steady on. This ensures that there is no flinch in anticipation of recoil. Continuing pressure on the trigger for an instant after firing is called follow through and helps to hold conscious sight alignment, especially for repeat shots. Using this basic technique will allow you to put the power of your sidearm where you need it most. The two hand hold is especially effective for manipulating the more powerful sidearms, particularly the 45 government model automatic pistol. In the program on basic familiarization with sidearms, we saw the power ranges of common service calibers. These were the 38 Special, the 357 Magnum, and the 45 Auto. You should also be familiar with the power range of other common rounds especially the 9mm Parabellum, used throughout the world. The 9 lies in power roughly between the standard 38 Special and the 357. It is chambered only in semi-automatic pistols. The 9mm sidearm most usually issued around the world is the Browning High Power. We also often encounter the Smith & Wesson Model 39, the automatic with a double-action trigger pull. To put pistol power further into perspective, we see the impacts of a 22 long rifle, the 380 or 9mm short, the 45 automatic, and the 44 magnum. Of all these, only the large-bore Magnum revolvers are more effective in power than the GI-45. As revolvers, they carry only six rounds and must be reloaded with single cartridges. Unless your sidearm duties require unusual power, perhaps to penetrate body armor or to serve in special forms of wildlife management, standard handguns offer all the tactical effectiveness necessary. The location of your duty holster is probably set by uniform regulations. Most services position the butt of the sidearm near the break of the right wrist. Your duty pistol may also be carried concealed in a cross draw or under belt holster. Concealment or a great deal of seated duty in car or office may dictate a variety of positions. Wherever your handgun is carried, you can learn to draw and fire it in less than one second by careful unloaded practice. Discipline your practice draw to be slow at first. Smoothness is what makes a draw fast when it has to be. In the Weaver or Cooper Combat Draw, 
the right hand grasps the sidearm and punches the knuckles of the gun hand solidly into the supporting hand. The arms, slightly bent at the elbow, snap the gun smartly to eye level and lock at that point. Eyes and trigger finger then work together to bring off an accurate shot that is quickly pressed off without jerking the trigger. As soon as convenient, after firing your service pistol, it should be cleaned, both to make sure that it does not corrode and to ensure its continued proper functioning. An automatic pistol of this design is simply stripped. First, you remove the magazine. Then, check to be sure that you have no shell in the chamber. Then, remove the recoil spring plunger by turning the barrel bushing. The slide is then retracted until the slide stop may be removed. Then the slide slid forward off the frame. In this position, the recoil spring and guide may be removed and the barrel extracted from the front. This may seem complicated, but it really is quite simple after a little reference to your study guide. This is an old fashioned pistol. There are newer designs such as this Browning, which strips rather more simply. Each pistol requires its own special study. We have seen what the built-in accuracy of today's service sidearm can accomplish. And the power it can deliver. Here is how speed puts them all together. Smooth, easy practice will lead to rapid, accurate defense shooting. Follow your range master's rules of safety as you progress. Soon you will be able successfully to defend yourself, other citizens, and our country with your service pistol. You will be able to overcome unequal odds and surprise assailants. By mastering weapon craft with your service pistol, you fulfill the trust placed in you by those who depend upon your skill. <laughs>